we are streaming live right now. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Eli. I am the communication coordinator at Jumpstart Refugee Talent. I am joining you from Vancouver, BC, the Coast Salish lands, the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, um, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, specifically. And we are joined today. Um, we're collaborating with Jumpstart. Is collaborating with Gabriel, basically. Uh, Jumpstart is a nonprofit that supports refugees find meaningful employment. And uh, we are here today in celebration of the Black History Month uh, in support of Afro-Canadians led initiatives. Uh, we would like to recognize an incredibly talented African-Canadian refugee author, uh, Gabriel Daishimie. Gabriel, I'll give it to you to introduce yourself, please. Thank you so much, Eli, for having me. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, recom uh, to uh, mention a land recognition. Uh, I'm joining you from uh, uh, London, Ontario, uh, on the land of uh, Mississauga land of Anishina Bewaki and uh, Atiwan de Rong. So as I said, uh, my name is Gabriel Ndaishimie. Um, I came here as, uh, as a young refugee, as a sponsored refugee student uh, at Huron College. And then uh, later on, I graduated uh, from Huron. And uh, right now, here I am, uh, one of you Canadians. Amazing. So Gabriel is the author of Ron Alvin, a book that I've been enjoying reading this past weekend. Uh, such an amazing work, Gabriel. Um, to start off, I have so many questions. Uh, I did resonate with a lot of things in the book. I have so many things to, I want to talk to you about today, uh, about this book specifically and your experience in general. Um, my first question, obvious question, Ron Elvin. How did you go up with this name? Or sorry, Ron Elvin. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, title. I, I developed that through uh, poetry, uh, you know, watching different kinds of uh, genres on poetry. And then I came across uh, one poem that uh, was titled Run, Black Boy Run, uh, by an American uh, author. There was also another inspirational page that basically uh, inspired the title of the poem itself. It was also called Run, Black Boy Run by Jonathan Hahn. And then there was another uh, hymn or a song that is mostly sung uh, during protest movements uh, at protests basically is called uh, Black Boy Run. So Black, Black Boy Run inspired Run Elvin. Uh, Run uh, because I always thought as a refugee, uh, I'm always on, on the run and, and my son was born in a refugee camp. Um, and then Elvin, uh, because uh, I thought that was my name, uh, Elvin, that was my father's name, I thought, but then later on it changed to uh, Livin. My mother told me uh, in 2019, in 2020, that your father actually, his name is Livin, not Elvin, but then it had already happened. I see. And your son's name is Elvin. My son's name is um, um, uh, Erwin Gabriel Jr. Elvin Gabriel Jr. Okay. So this book, Run Elvin, is a reflection of Gabriel's journey, uh, starting from when he was only two months old, when the Rwandan genocide took place in 1994, um, and you know all the way to his life through uh, different camps in, in, in uh, different parts of Africa, and then all the way to to, to journey to Canada, basically. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for your courageous vulnerability in sharing these stories of, uh, of, of the genocide, the traumas, uh, the survival, survival guilt as well. Um, you know, myself being a fourth generation um, grandson of victims of genocide, that being the Armenian genocide, I fully uh, understand and resonate with a lot of things that you were mentioning uh, in this book. And also my live, my personal lived experience as a refugee arriving to Canada too. Um, so there's a lot of things that just spoke to me uh, and I had to take some time as well to just like, you know, this is, this is very much um, close 
you know, a lot of experiences were similar yet different in many ways. And that's the beauty of, of a lot of our stories. Uh, so mm -hmm. my question would be to you, you, you were sharing a lot about the traumas you face and then also parts of the healings. I wanted to ask, like, what are some of the ways uh, you did or what are the things that you did in your journey of healing? Well, um, I tried basically to uh, to be a writer uh, ever since I was young, uh, ever since I was in primary school. Um, I started off as a, as a musician. I was writing also short poetry in 2006 in primary school. And then in 2010, I, I, I recorded my first song. It's on YouTube. Uh, I sang it to my girlfriend in high school and in primary school. <laughs> there is that. There is always that. And then, um, yeah, and then in Canada, uh, I was inspired when uh, uh, Michelle uh, Jamba uh, released his uh, first book in, in 2018. In the summer of 2018, that's when I got hot on his book, um, I read it, and I said, well, there we go. Now I can write. So, yeah, I was actually inspired by him to start basically working on my, my Facebook. And that's when I started reading a lot of genres, a lot of books, um, you know. Um, and then I was inspired throughout the process. And then uh, the book the book was written and, and published. Amazing. It's, it's wonderful to see two amazing authors being able to write the experiences. Uh, the second one being in Jamba or Jean-Michel. Uh, Kofi, who we're also featuring his book in our donation store. Uh, and then today we, we also wanted to, to feature your book. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of similarities as well. And again, lots of differences because you both come from different places, but you grew up in, in a certain uh, camp together as well, as you mentioned, correct? Yes. Uh, yes. So Sharon and I have uh, a long history together. We grew up uh, in the same neighborhood. Uh, we would fetch the water together. We mostly would meet in the evening at, at the borehole. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember him and his brother. Uh, we would meet also early in the morning, uh, around 4 o'clock when we were fetching water, uh, you know, preparing to go to school. And uh, it's, it's, it's just sort of uh, very interesting how things come together in the end. And I appreciate that he really did encourage me uh, during the early drafts of my, my book. He read um, every chapters of my book and gave me feedback on that. And so, yeah, it's very good to be supported by people uh, of, uh, uh, who come from your own background and who are doing the very same work. It really helps. That's amazing. Shout out to Njamba if he's out there. Uh, I'm sure he's going to listen to this later on as well. If not, he's not seeing this live right now. Uh, in your book, you were talking about colonialism and the effect of colonialism in Rwanda, uh, which also can be very similar to the experiences of colonialism in just anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, different parts of different countries in Africa face that, uh, not just the effects of when the colonizers were there, but also the aftermath of it and what it created. Similar goes to where I'm coming from as well, Syria, Lebanon, and all these countries. Um, and then yet some countries right now are still living under uh, colonial rule. Um, so, so my question is for you, um, as an African Canadian and a refugee in Canada, how do you feel like you've related or connected maybe uh, to the indigenous um, uh, communities of Canada um, as communities who have similar and yet different relationship to colonialism? Yeah, so... Um... I would say what basically colonialism uh, uh, did or does is uh, first of all divide our people and find ways basically to uh, to rule them, you know, and and then to subjugate them basically under under colonial rule. It's a it's a very manipulative system. Um, it is also uh, a very uh, dehumanizing system that uh, really no one should should, should live under. Um, in the case of Rwanda, uh, the results of it were the 1994 genocide, but there were also other uh, killings before that, before the 1994, which were never uh, recognized as a genocide as such, but as mass killings, and they were never documented in the history. Uh, I would also talk and probably another writer, uh, probably in Jamba, because uh, he's, uh, he's Congolese, he would 
probably talk on uh, you know uh, the killings in, in in Congo under under you know uh, the king of uh, the king of Belgium, you know. And so what colonialism did here in Canada, it's uh, it's it's really it's pretty much uh, the very same thing that happened elsewhere. And I I do sympathize uh, with uh, indigenous communities. I I I, um, I understand also their struggle. Uh, basically to decolonize, uh, you know, the land and also to decolonize the economy uh, so that they can also, uh, you know, be uh, recognized and uh, and be respected um, as a people. Um, but it's just a very complex uh, a system that we are living in right now, you know. Um, but then... Uh, there is a way because these conversations, they just don't end there. They, they, they continue through generations. Uh, people tell stories of their experiences. Uh, people write about their experiences. And so there is that. I would say some, uh, so far um, what has happened uh, in Canada, uh, they are getting there. Generations are coming together and generations are talking to each other. They are sharing stories of their experiences, both Canadians, white Canadians, black Canadians, uh, you know, uh, Italians, uh, you know, Canadians from all those sorts and the and indigenous communities are coming basically together to share their experiences. So it's something that should be encouraged. Uh, it's basically something that should be basically promoted. And uh, yeah. I remember reading this, um, I guess, or, or hearing at least, a professor, an indigenous professor from the University of Manitoba, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was saying maybe you weren't part of the problem, but you can be part of the solution. And that's something I, I also aspire to work on and, and hopefully a meaningful change can happen. Um, you were mentioning something about, you know, you, you, you were happy when uh, you felt fit in, in one of the schools uh, throughout your experience in, in the refugee camp. Um, just want to know how was your experience maybe f trying to fit in into um, or adapting to Canada maybe maybe I'm trying to find a better word to use it but for lack of better words let's go with fit in or adapting now yeah so uh, I think you're talking about the uh, the chapter where I talk about my secondary school experiences and uh, you know my lack of a better uniform that could help Correct. me uh, you know, identify as a, as a, as a student because we all loved uniforms. You know, black and white, and then good shoes. Um, over time, I did fit in because I took uh, I, I decided to become a leader of um, you know to to run for uh, leadership uh, positions uh, in school, become a class monitor. So those kind they kind of cultivate a certain sense of respect. Here in Canada, I also tried to do the same in, 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 in university, right? Just to get myself out there to be recognized and to be respected because the moment you get yourself out there, people start coming to you. People start to understand you from not only you as an individual, but they start uh, understanding the story, the story of where you are coming from. And that story connects them because then they, can, they are able to draw similarities from their everyday experiences. And that basically is what builds community. And so um, it was not a very hard experience. I wouldn't say I've, I have assimilated fully. There are still so many things uh, that I, I'm still working on and uh, I have to learn and, and unlearn certain other stuff, you know. But uh, it's a journey we are all learning and uh, we keep learning as we grow up, so yeah. It is, it is a journey, definitely. Um, I mean, it's a journey I've been part of as well, sharing an experience uh, of, of, of being a refugee as well in Canada. Um, speaking of, just thinking of the word refugee, what, what does that term imply to you? What does it mean? What does it mean when someone's referring, saying refugee? Um, or maybe to you, how do you look at it? So... I look at it as a, as a temporary status uh, in, in one's life, especially uh, among the people who have been forced basically to get out of their country because of circumstances that are beyond their control, you know, that could be war. But I'm trying to run away from uh, the UNHCR's definition of a refugee because it's very hegemonic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are a lot of things that I don't agree with, and, and, and so many scholars do. So, but 
refugee is a temporary uh, status in one's life, a temporary, you know, a very temporary. But the problem of that is that it, it lives with you once you've been a refugee. Once you've been a refugee or you're always a refugee, you can never really uh, run away from uh, uh, that, uh, that particular identity. I think the only thing you can do is basically uh, not to accept it as the status quo, but basically to, to find ways to live through it and, 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 and to live with it, you know, uh, and, and also to build, to build kind of walls just so that it doesn't close certain parts of your brain. And, you know, you, in a way, how can I explain it? Hmm. Being a refugee is tough. It is tough because the moment you accept to become a refugee, you are accepting to be vulnerable and nobody wants to be vulnerable. Everyone wants to be strong, right? So to maintain that strength after you have be, become a refugee, after you have crossed the border uh, and, and you are in, in another people's border, you have to be very eventful. You have to be very, uh, very creative. And one of the creativity is basically finding ways to use that particular identity to connect with, to connect with others who would otherwise push you outside of their country or outside of their societies because you are different, you know? So you are always fighting basically a struggle to fit in, into a system that would not, that was otherwise not built for you. So it's a constant struggle, but through creativity, we still connect with humans because humans sympathize, you know? Humans uh, understand from a, uh, a point of view, from, from a sympathy point of view. So there is always that quick point in humans that basically connects us all together uh, through uh, sharing our experiences. I love also how you mentioned, uh, you know, in, in, in reference to your book as well, um, the idea of survival. Uh, being being able to survive something and uh, just as you mentioned right now as well in terms of you know not this the system or the, the the place that you're at doesn't fit you you know you just have you because you're different because you you have a different way of thought and that itself is something powerful and resilience and that's something to me how how i would uh see a refugee person as someone resilient someone who was able to survive someone who was you know very much powerful enough to just get up on the field feet and able to leave as well and, and continue living and continue uh, you know, being productive and, and part of the community part of the societies um, unfortunately of course we can also recognize the people who have lost their their lives uh, attempt, in attempts of finding that better better life um, and that's why we're doing this that's why we're talking about this that's why we're also raising awareness that's why we're saying you know it's it's it's, it's more than just what you see in the news what you read about mm -hmm. um there's there's a lot of resilience there's a lot of power in that too um one of the other common i guess commonalities common experiences that i found reading the book was uh with your experience talking about uh the world university service of canada the organization that sponsored uh, you to come and study in, in Canada, but also it sponsored me. So yeah. uh, very much similar experience in terms of patience in waiting, yeah. uh, patience in not knowing when you're heading out, when you're going to Canada, and just, uh, just the moment when you hear the news that you were selected out of the thousands or I don't know how many applicants, uh, a certain number is only selected and from this certain number that was selected, your name was there too. So I would love to hear you, how was how did you feel in that moment? Uh, mixed mixed emotions. So I was in the JCM uh, building, um, working on my assignments. I was doing uh, a diploma studies with uh, you know Regis universities in the in the US. Mm -hmm. The friend of me, me came and, and and told me that uh, Gabriel, the list is out, and. Uh, just go and, and, and see for yourself. He didn't tell me exactly. So my heart was pumping. Uh, I, I left the building. I went to check the, uh, the list. First thing was trying basically to find my name before I would find everyone else. So I was there and I jumped, I jumped up, you know. <laughs> From nowhere, I started making noise and, you know, so much noise. And when I came down, I said, okay, 
now I can look for my friends. You know, yes. I can look who else is on the list among mm -hmm. my friends. Um, lucky enough, so many were there, but also so many others who were very bright students were left. And I talk about that in the book, how I basically uh, sympathize with uh, the bright students who were left out and how uh, you know, uh, my position, me taking that particular space, uh, meant that uh, another person, another person who had potential had fallen. So when I received the opportunity to come to Canada through our uh, World University Services of Canada, I said, well, I better make uh, this opportunity count. And uh, I think that is what I've been working towards. Uh, I would say overall, uh, uh, WUSC is, is, is uh, a unique program in the world. You know, it gives uh, you know, opportunities to young people who otherwise will not have access to education, you know, to quality education and also an opportunity to become Canadian upon arrival. And, you know, with a Canadian passport, you can do so much. With a Canadian passport, you literally have the entire world in your hand. So um, you just have to, when you reach here, you just have this kind of to, to be patient and learn and connect with people. Um, yeah, there is there is that excitement to, to it. Exactly. Um, it's, it's an amazing moment for people who, you know, probably escaping war, refugees around the world. However, we also acknowledge that still this idea, the idea of colonialism that is taking place here, uh, even with the division of like which state carries the strongest passport, which which is another issue that we need to tackle on, not today, but uh, that's a conversation for another day, maybe. Um, yeah, so I would love to hear if you uh, if you're able to share maybe paragraph or two from your from your book with us. Um, I'd love to hear some of your uh, writings. Yes. <clears throat> I do have a, a paragraph that I want to read. Now, this paragraph talks about my experiences going back to Malawi in 2019 uh, when I was uh, in the aeroplane. You know, um, uh, I was going to meet my son for the first time. So it just shows uh, the emotions and, uh, you know, and the experiences, things that were basically running through my head and running through my mind. So it reads, throughout my lifetime, many things that were supposed to be safe and keep you that way turned out to be nothing more than snares disguised with an idealized cloth. But when you are a thousand feet up in the air, with nowhere to go except in your mind, one can feel a little foolish exposing their apprehension to their peers, those who are happily chanting about upcoming adventures, breathing deeply as they doze off or snorting with laughter at an airplane movie you can't quite see. Despite my intermittent heart palpitations and the dark thoughts that threaten to overshadow the Sunday I could see glowing through the oddly shaped plane window, I kept calm. Whenever those disturbing thoughts crossed my mind, I promised myself all was well. After a total of 18 hours suspended in the air, we neared our final destination. I was meeting you the next day. So, as I said, it's a uh, it's the worries that I had, you know, things I was worried about uh, meeting my son for the first time, um, whether I would make it or not, because at times planes can be cruel, but they are the safest mode of transport to, to travel in. Uh, a friend of mine one time reminded me when I was briefing uh, her about my journey to, to Africa, to Malawi. And so I was worried <laughs> that I would not make it, but I made it and... Uh, yeah, it was a happy moment to, to meet him for the first time. The other thing is that uh, I grew up fatherless, you know. And so me meeting my, my son for the first time was basically breaking that cycle that uh, at least I've met, uh, you know, the person that I brought into this world. Um, I'm breaking that cycle uh, that, you know, that, that uh, my father uh, never did, you know, something that... Uh, never happened because of colonialism, because of the genocide. I have so many things to blame 
Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the world we live. But also, you know, you have to give yourself credit too here because, um, you know, you, you maybe you grew up fatherless, but you didn't want to do that same experience to your son or, or, or you know, um, just you have your own journey of, of being a refugee, uh, for your own experience of, of traveling and, and you you know, you grew up in a refugee camp and traveled to Canada as a refugee and just a, a lot of your traumas, your own traumas, and yet you still was able to go and be there with your son. Uh, it's something that I feel, you know, we learned a lot of things from my, our, our families, our parents, a lot of the good things and also some of the not so good things, let's say. Um, and we tried to do better for ourselves and for our peers and for our, our, our family members and for our kids. Um, I want to know what does fatherhood mean to you? Well, it means everything, you know. It means everything. Fathers should always be there to protect their family. Uh, I wish my father was there to protect my family, uh, to protect me and uh, to protect, you know, uh, his grandson. But uh, those are conditions or situations totally beyond his con that we are beyond his control. Now, I don't know him. I don't know what happened, you know. Um, I wouldn't blame him for anything if he's there and if he's listening right now. Uh, but uh, fatherhood really means everything, you know. When you have, a, when you are a father, uh, your sons always feel safe. They have someone to look up to. Now, becoming a good father and a bad father—that's totally another thing, you know. You would be a father, but then you know, not be able to uh, care for your family. But also, those actually, I wouldn't judge them as such because society has uh, has has impact, has an impact that it plays on producing good fathers and, and, and bad fathers. You know what I mean? So we are all born in this world, but then the world treats us differently and uh, the world molds us basically into what we become. At a certain age, at a certain point in life, uh, then we decide what we become based on the resources around us, you know, but also based on the connections that we have around us. So I wouldn't uh, judge anyone harshly to that uh, they are bad fathers per se. I would say that uh, it's just circumstances around them that uh, never give them, never gave them an opportunity. Because people, I believe that humans are inherently good. It's just the way this, the ways in which uh, society treats them that uh, turns them into the beast they are. You know, so. Yeah, I, I still have hope in, in humanity. I still have hope uh, in, in, in father fathers and and, 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 and fa people who are going to be fathers in the in the in the near future. And this book is basically just about that, right? This book is uh, uh, encouraging me basically to become the best father that I can be to my son, but also encouraging other fathers uh, to be the best fathers they can be in their family. Uh, toxic masculinity. Is something that uh, this book is basically fighting uh, from all corners of the world, you know. So I would say that um, the book is encouraging uh, people to be good fathers. I, I agree. I mean, I, I've read it cover to cover, and it's it's just it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful read, uh, to be honest. And in the in the chapter where you mention uh, you talk about your father. Um, when your mom sent you the letter, I think, uh, was in 2020. Um, yeah, that was in 2020, in May 2020. May 2020. So you received the letter, letter, uh, and she was mentioning things about your father. And then towards the end, um, you were talking about forgiveness. And part of that forgiveness was also being kind to yourself. Um, what does that look like? It's hard because... I hadn't forgiven myself until three weeks ago, you know, uh, triggered by the book, you know. Um, I haven't read the book, but I tried to read the book, but the book is a very serious book. I never thought about it that way. So, and I put, I put down the book just basically to feel calm about, about myself and about everything. But uh, I've had moments and my mother has apologized to me so many times. She feels very guilty that uh, things ended up the way it is, but 
it's the way it is you know it's it's life i don't blame her for anything you know but uh, there is always that to 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 a mother even though i'm doing i'm doing good here in canada you know but uh yeah I, i would say that uh, forgiveness is a journey I, i and also being kind to yourself is is a journey just and that's just it doesn't come at once you know i'm still learning to be kind to myself to be kind to the world around me uh to understand things as they come but also um to take time to to understand things that i don't have control over you know and and, and just accept them as uh, as as they come and then as they go to let go basically of, of, of things i can't control as as you said you know like learning um uh, it's a journey of learning but also i think it's a journey of, of unlearning some of the habits specifically yeah. like toxic masculinity uh exactly. and other other toxic things that you grew up not necessarily controlling but they were embedded in you in one way or another so mm-hmm. unlearning these behaviors and learning some of the um uh, positive ones not toxic positive ones because as well that hurts sometimes so being uh uh i think one one chapter you're mentioning something about being uh you know um, hopeful but also not being foolish rather being uh smart yeah. about your choices and you yeah. know knowing how to hope um so basically yeah the book you can find it on our donation store jumpstart of the donation store the way it works is when you make a donation there is three wins so there's a win 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 one win is for the person who's donating uh giving a donation to jumpstart because they will be receiving a signed copy of the book from Gabriel and another the second win is Gabriel will receive a portion of this uh profit and then this the third portion the third win goes to jumpstart to carry on our programs in support of refugees finding meaningful employment um so make sure to go and donate um go to the jumpstart donation store and uh, yeah i want to carry on with with few questions that left here um if you had a superpower what would it be well wow. yeah i that that question uh it's a tough one you know but uh if i had superpowers i don't watch movies on superpower but i watch so many movies on empathy and pain and and, and suffering you know um the last movie that i watched with a friend of mine was uh uh i don't remember its title but it had to do with uh, uh the holocaust and uh uh a pianist it's called actually the pianist you know yeah the pianist um it had to do with uh with you know traumatic experiences that the that, that the actor you know went through uh how he lost his family you know but uh their own situation changed you know later on you know he 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 was he, he was one of the holocaust survivors and and then he lived to tell basically tell tell his story so if i had superpowers um i would wish to eliminate pain and suffering you know that power basically to stop you know to stop pain and and and, and suffering i i would ask that you know in 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 the yeah and there is there's also a lot lots of problems with that too. I don't know. But okay. yeah, that, that that is my wish, man. That is uh that is my wish. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you for this selfless wish as well. Um and yeah. You you are you are doing that in in maybe indirect ways by talking about uh be, being first of all a, a man yourself. I'm sorry if you, I don't know if you identify with the cover this or do you if you identify as a, as a male or uh, do you have any other gender preferences pronounces i identify as male yeah okay great so so being a, a, a man yourself and being able to showcase this vulnerability and and talk about the pain and talk about the traumas and healing and forgiving uh self forgiving and being kind to yourself loving to yourself loving yourself loving your family or your your kids and everybody that itself is uh is is contributing to the process of healing and not just to you to your pain as well but to others um you definitely touched me in a lot of ways so i can assure you your your superpower is maybe you know indirectly being effective uh mm-hmm. slowly so thank you so much um 
what advice do you have to refugees around the world? Um, uh, the young ones, uh, the young ones who are, you know, who are in school, I would uh, urge them basically to keep pushing, to keep working hard uh, in school, uh, to read a lot, uh, you know, to use the library so much. I wish I had enough time uh, uh, to use the library when I was young. Um, I would also encourage them basically to not lose hope, to, to not give up. Uh, to the elder ones, I would uh, advise them to encourage their young ones basically to read, you know, mm -hmm. just push them in the in the library, you know, uh, buy them books. Um, when I was growing up, uh, my grandfather gave me a Bible, uh, gave me, uh, you know, a book from the church, you know. But uh, nobody ever bought me a book, you know. <laughs> so I wish somebody bought me a book. Uh, they, but the good thing is they always pushed me to go to school, you know. I always had everything I had basically to succeed in school uh, academic-wise. I had food, I had shelter, you know. Um, uh, those, the basics were provided, and, 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 and I can't complain. They really tried their, their, their level best, and I thank them for that. So I would say basically uh, people who are living in refugee con conditions, their parents should support their kids in academic endeavors as much as they can. Uh, the kids uh, should use the library as much as they, they can uh, and should read a lot of books, any books they can get the answer. Yeah, and uh, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think this is everything. Otherwise, I want to thank you all uh, and, and, and Jumpstart for basically inviting me to this uh, conversation and also for giving me an opportunity to talk about my book. Uh, this interview has been uh, that special. Of course. Thank you so much. And you're working on different initiatives yourself. Um, um, so if you'd like to mention anything about that, um, do you have anything? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm working on uh, 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 my company, which is called Live and Books. And uh, Live and Books, basically, its mission is to publish books that are written by uh, uh, refugees, uh, young people and uh, refugees in general, who are talking about colonialism, who are talking about their experiences as refugees, who are basically trying to heal. Uh, now, it's a non-profit organization. Uh, we are going to basically be accepting uh, submissions of all kinds, poems, uh, you know, short stories, uh, drama, and, you know. So the organization is still in process. It's already registered in Canada um, and, and recognized. And we are also opening another branch in Malawi. Mm -hmm. so we have access to young people who are writing in the refugee camp, in Zarika refugee camp. So, yeah, things are getting exciting as we are going. And uh, I would age everybody basically to uh, just keep in touch. They can reach out to me uh, directly through my Facebook links or through on Facebook if anyone wants to talk or they have questions about my organization, but also about writing in general. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for real. Um, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to Gabriel. You can, don't be strangers, talk, talk to us. Um, you know, be friends with the refugee. You know, we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're cool people. So uh, come and talk to us anytime. Um, make sure you go to the donation store as well to get your copy very interesting year uh book uh warning there might be some triggers um it did it did trigger me some parts but it was a very smooth read as well towards the end um thank you so much for your work thank you so much for for being with us today um and i wish you a great rest of your day gabriel all right thank you so much brother thank you have a good night bye